Today on Lightning Bugs. Recently, I was archiving my millions of boxes that I've had in my room, and I wanted to get rid of them, of sketches. You know, there's, uh, I'm, I'm delivering it all to the National Library in Australia. But while I'm doing it, I'm supposed to kind of write down what it is. So making lists. Uh, and I sort of have to look at every single page, even if there's a really crappy page, you know, I still have to look at it. Just recently, I found a piece that no one is playing. If no one liked it, it was not a success. It was 25 years ago. I wrote this piece and I looked at it and I looked at some pages and they were little snippets that I really liked. They were part of instrumentation. They weren't main material. Mm. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll use that. And suddenly it became a whole movement of the piano concerto I'm writing. And oh, it helped me, it helped me get in. So occasionally you get confronted with your old self um, and realize your old self wasn't all bad. You know? Wasn't all bad. I know. <laughs> Hi, if you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. Happy Thursday. It's me, Ben. It's Lightning Bugs, a creative conversations with me. Uh, Elena Katz Chernin is a renowned composer based in Sydney, Australia, where I live some of the time. Her work covers nearly all genres, from instrumental solo to ensemble pieces to symphonic and chamber orchestral pieces. She's received numerous honors, such as the Classical Music Award of the Australian Music Center and the Jean Bogan Prize. Is that right? Or Jean Bogan? Um, you know, I actually don't know how to pronounce. I've never actually had to say it. <laughs> it's just you won it. the Bogan Prize. That's the point. <laughs> yes. It's all styles. Have you ever played with Cold Chisel? <laughs> no, I've never played with anybody outside the, well, not true, outside the classical world. But actually, that's not quite true. That's not but true, yes, yeah. But not with Cold Chisel. No, that's iconic. Yes, you're iconic too. Okay, I'm going to keep my introduction going. In 2019, Elena was named Officer of the Order of Australia, Kids in America, and that was a big deal which is the highest recognition of the Australian Honor System appointments for outstanding achievement and service. She's highly respected. I think she's cool as shit. We have a great time <laughs> together, whether we're in the studio or, or, or just uh, talking. Uh, without further ado, Elena Katz-Chernin. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an introduction. Amazing. So I don't even remember what we talked about last time, do you? I do, and I try not to say the same things. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter because we're reliving the magic. Um, well, okay, let's think of it this way. Uh, since since we've done this once before, um, this is a podcast about creativity. So let's just try to really keep it on how you think you make stuff. And let me start with this. Elena and I were working. I asked Elena if she would help me uh, score some music beneath one of my podcast guests who's yet to be released, Roger Payne. And uh, I think about two hours later, you had sent 30 voice notes <laughs> off your phone, and they were all different. <laughs> um. You're a classical <laughs> composer, and you're sitting there with your phone like a kid, improvising like thirty things. Is that the way you? Is that the way you write? Like when you write a piece? In a way, yes. Uh, except I don't record. I just write. I shorthand um, on a piece of paper with the pen, you know, like this, a real pen. Yeah. And um, why thirty? Is because I I write I I, I improvise a lot, and then yeah. I think it's not good enough. I can do better. So I try okay. something completely different. And so they keep jumping. And then I try something, you know, very little, very much. Uh, high, low, fast, slow. You know, there's so many options. Different keys, modulations, not no modulations. The same key, static, sparse. Um, and, you know, and I think the best one um, usually is the one I think is the silliest you know the the the, the most stupid I, the, at some point i just say to myself what's the most stupid thing i can do and you just use you know two notes and 
do something mm. like a little child song. And uh, sometimes the best ideas happen because I do something that I think I shouldn't. I, I, I sort of say to myself, what is it going to be that someone is not going to like or no one is going to like? Oh, really? <laughs> and then, yeah. And then I do something and suddenly it happens that it actually is better than everything else. You know, Weird. Okay. Th- th- that's really cool to me because you know what, what I always, uh, the way I always thought of, and I'm a rock and roll musician, so I, I frame things differently. I always saw that, I called it breaking the law. When I would oh. break the law, I was happy. Yeah. When I wasn't breaking the law, I wasn't happy. And I'm a law-abiding <laughs> citizen, but, but it's, it's kind of the same. It's the law of the music, how you create uh, composing. I break rules constantly. And if I don't have rules to break, I make the rules. You know, I okay. say, I'm not allowed to use B-flat or not allowed to use any major chords. You know, just really? so stupid. But only for like half a minute, you know, nothing huge. Yeah. But it helps me. It it helps me to limit myself. And with the as you know, within limitations, you've got freedom, great freedom. So yeah. another word I was another sentence I always say, um, well, actually another two. One is everything is possible, and the other is All what is the if. <laughs> Yeah, or what if? What if I do this? What if I combine, you know, C sharp with, um, you know, F minor? You know, well, mm. that's actually a bad, bad example because it actually fits. <laughs> it like fits well, flat, yeah. It's, it, it's D flat major seven, but it's it's um, um, just something not fitting together or two chords on top of each other that are very unrelated, and that is kind of fun. But you, when you come to improvise, it doesn't necessarily happen automatically. Sometimes mm-hmm. it, it happens accidentally. I, I press the wrong note, and suddenly the wrong note is the best note <laughs> of all. <laughs> so you 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 re, you like to do it at the piano because you can react against against the uh, against your mistakes and against the sound of it and against the moments. You can begin to improvise based on what you've heard. Yes, my fingers sometimes, especially when I'm really tired, they suddenly do something. I had no idea I could <laughs> I could come up with. <laughs> and yeah. at first I may think, oh, that's terrible. But then I think, what if I do this, make this terrible material in a very different way? You know, what if I play it a hundred times slower or something? Do you sit down to create? Like, do you sit down and go, I'm going to sit down and write music? Well, that's my job. <laughs> I do it every day. I do it every single day. So you it's not like you just kind of go about your day and when something hits you, then you stop what you're doing. You make like hours to do it? I, you know, I sometimes, very rarely, something happens in my head. A few times that happens. In, I, I can, I even remember the pieces that came to my head suddenly, out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. That's rare, but it happens. Um, mostly, um, when that happens, I just kind of jot it down on a napkin or on a, whatever, whatever comes my, you know, in my way, <laughs> a piece of paper yeah. quickly, because my memory is zero um, and it's just not great. And so, which is kind of good because I keep it, everything pure, you know, <laughs> I never know. Fresh. Is. <laughs> Every day is a new day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's, yeah, I start fresh and I can't remember anything. Well, I can a little, but in, in a, I try not to because it's actually quite good for me to start fresh. So when I'm at the piano, I always think, what did I do yesterday? Today I do something very different. You know, I have sketches, you know, millions of sketches. And then I just look at what I've done um, and sometimes try something opposite. And uh, usually everything ends up in the bin. A lot of things end up in the bin every day. And you, and you don't remember those. Do you ever, do you ever find that you, uh, I improvise a song um usually once a night at my uh, at my concerts. And most of the time, they're very different. But sometimes I won't even remember that something from three years ago, I, I, I'm now doing something kind of similar. It's not from memory. It's almost like the, the big tape in my head is rolling back around and that thought is coming back up and bubbling back up. Do you, do you find that happens? That has happened, actually. Recently... I was archiving my millions of boxes that I've had in my room and I wanted to get rid of them, of sketches. You know, there's, uh, I'm, I'm delivering it all to the National Library in Australia. 
which is great because that means yeah. my room has more space. But while yeah. I'm doing it, I'm supposed to kind of write down what it is. So mm-hmm. making lists. Uh, and I sort of have to look at every single page, even if there's a really crappy page, you know, I still yeah. have to look at it. And occasionally I found, a, 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 actually, well, not, just recently I found a piece that no one is playing. If no one liked it, it was not a success. It was 25 years ago. I wrote this piece and I looked at it and I looked at some pages and they were little snippets that I really liked. They were part of instrumentation. They weren't main material. Mm. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll use that. And suddenly it became a whole movement of the piano concerto I'm writing. And oh, it helped me. It helped me get in. So occasionally you get confronted with your old self yeah. um, and realize your old self wasn't all bad. You know? wasn't all bad. I know. Because we want to throw that away. Like you reinvent yourself and you improve and you want to just go, ah, that old me from 10 years ago was an idiot. But then you listen to some of it and you're like, oh, not so bad. Not all of it. Isn't that a great feeling to have the knowledge that you actually already then were pretty good? I mean, that is great to know because we often underestimate our current work. Um, we think it's not good enough. But when we look back at it, you think, oh, that was actually really fresh and unusual, interesting. Why don't I write like this now? <laughs> this, and that's what I was going to ask you next is like, have you seen any correlation between what's going on in your life and the tone of the music that you're writing? Are they separate or, or, or do they reflect? You know, they were more together earlier, like 20 years ago, I had my children at home. So I was very busy and there was constant dramas of this, that and the other. And that really, truly went into my pieces because I was very affected every single day by what the children are doing. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I live on my own and I am kind of working with people occasionally here in the house, but, and then I get kind of inspired by other people. Um, But I'm much more neutral. It's I just reflect the uh, the world more, uh, more general ideas. Uh, people who commission a piece, I reflect what they are wanting or what mm-hmm. it's about them. I learn about human stories. I am much more open to the outside of me. You know, so you I'm feel like you're writing myself. about externally rather than telling your inner journal. That's well. It's yeah. It's much less of an inner journal, and it's more reflection on what's around me mm-hmm. I you know I don't usually write very um programmatic music so it's not really about a story but it's mm-hmm. inspired by a story often by a person's character or uh what a person's journey was um you know I have recently had a few commissions in memory of someone so mm-hmm. you try to find out who, what that person was what their journey was, where they were born, where they came from, where they went to, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So I have to know. Um, and that's actually, it's really great because it's always different. It's never yeah. the same. So the pieces always get kind of a different guidance. Do, um, you know, I, I had to do that, something similar to that a few years ago. The Washington Post, an American newspaper, uh, was getting various artists to uh, to write uh, to do their art almost as reportage. So I was given uh, the uh, uh, deputy um, uh, uh, attorney general, uh, Rod Rosenstein, and I had to um, I had to research him and I listened to all of his speeches and I researched his life, his cases, everything that he had done. And then I wrote a song from his perspective. And uh, I love that. Like, because if I'm interested in it, it is about me a little bit, you know, like, so I'm re- I'm relating to him. But I like that better than the journal uh, vibe. Yeah, it's more interesting to write about other, other people. But it sounds fantastic what you, you know, your story, because you obviously chose the bits that connected with you. So you yeah. have to choose. The choices are the difficult ones to make. It's the uh, framing, once- yeah. Yeah, how do you structure uh, someone's life or someone's millions of speeches into a song or into a project, into a bigger piece? What is it? Um, 
I had similar things at one point, also public figure, and also had to study the speeches. Um, but luckily, I had a collaborator um, who wrote the words, Tamara Anishislovska. She wrote um, the libretto for that. <laughs> it was a vocal piece. So um, she did all the research, uh, which is great because um, I, rather than reading, I'd rather just write another piece. But that's just because. Um, <laughs> do you know? <laughs> yeah, I, there's a great, great line. Um, I recently did an opera on uh, the great iconic painter in Australia called Brett Whiteley, and he had a fantastic line, and I just like that line. Um, he was asked if he reads a lot. It was in one of his radio interviews, and I listened to those for research. And he said, um, I don't want to waste my eyesight on reading. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, but, so, but, that's, but he was very knowledgeable, yes. and he was an amazing painter. But what he did, he got his friends to come and read to him. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that's what he loved that. And I just think it's a fantastic line. It doesn't apply to me. I don't, it's not because of eyesight. It's because I truly very le- rarely have time to read mm-hmm. a lot of research or a lot of books. I, I do like reading. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a luxury that I just don't usually have at the moment. You, you stay busy. <laughs> Which is amazing. I mean, no, it's amazing. Like, I mean, think about that. Like, like the just uh, thinking of yourself, uh, you know, when you were a little girl, for someone to say, you will be a composer and you'll be busy and people will listen to your music all over the world. What would you have thought about that? I wouldn't have believed people. I wouldn't have believed. Yeah. But I've dreamt. I've dreamt it. Um, and I... Always, that's all I wanted to do. I mean, it's it's funny because when I talk about myself, it's actually quite boring because that's I, I never wanted to be something. <laughs> yeah, but thank you. You're just very kind. But it, actually, other people have aspirations to be this, that, the other. Mm. I never had anything. I've just right. always, since, since I was five, I wanted to be a composer. And that's, I'm just extremely lucky that I've had, you know, all sorts of circumstances, you know, there's a lots of circumstances that can put you off, yeah. including failures of pieces. I've written some duds and, yeah. and they could have stopped me. And actually it did, you know, once I wrote a terrible failure and I stopped writing completely. Why was it a um, failure? Why do you call it a failure? Because I think I, I, I wanted to try something technical. It was mm. a technical exercise. There was two reasons. One, I was possibly not yet good enough. <laughs> I don't know. I was trying. I was writing experimental music. And um, in that world, it, you had to always say something different because it's quite hard. I mean, it's yeah. all, all atonal. It's all dissonant. And you've got to find sounds. And it's, it has to and be something so how long ago, can I ask you, how long, ago, how long ago was that? How old were you? That was 85, I think. Okay. I think, I wait, or 86. I, it, it, I, it I remember now. Yeah. yeah, it was like it's, yeah, it's a long time ago. And I was a student of this amazing composer called Helmut Lachenmann. And he um, suggested that I write a piece for a festival that was honoring him. So that was huge pressure. I think yeah. I wasn't ready for a big pressure yet. Um, now I love pressure. But in those days, it was my first commission from German uh, company, from festival. And it was for three people. For th- It was a trio. For um, for flute, cello, and, and percussion, but they were all professors. And they were all already very famous, so mm-hmm. it, it was not like I was writing for other students. And yeah. I probably tried too hard <laughs> to yeah. You to tried to Im- you were trying to impress them. Yeah, yeah, and I obviously did not <laughs> yeah. impress well, anyone. <laughs> how could you? That's not. It's not a. And I still do that all the time. Like especially if I'm making something that I, I know there will be a certain audience of someone that I that I respect, it does occur to me. I think, oh, I should throw in a little of this. That'll impress them. It's not a good idea, is it? No, it's a wrong way around. It's, yeah. not, a quite, it's not a right reason to do something. I think it, it takes a lot of, I think it takes experience. And I see young students, young composers do that as well today yeah, because they try too hard and they, they think that's the only chance they have and they've got to push everything into it. And 
show what they can do and that's show the what they thing. can do because I yeah. think I, I mean I mean I know what you mean by try too hard I've always felt like I wanted to avoid saying that because I feel like you should try too hard but just not at that like you have to try too hard at the right things like make sure it's making you it's moving you make sure it's what you meant to say make sure every note's what you want that's trying too hard but when people are are, are taking that energy and and you're trying to satiate your ego, I I don't think that works very often. Maybe it does sometimes, but not often. No, no. And it's it, it, you, you learn about that over time. You can't know that. No one can tell you that. And if I tell it to someone, they think, oh, yeah, you're just saying it because. But I know. It's hard it's to – people – you have to learn it yourself. Well, I improvise every night, like with whether it's with an orchestra or by myself. In one night, uh, uh, Michael Tilson Thomas, you know, uh, uh, MTT, yes. he was there, and and he, he's sort of a friend of mine. He's sort of a a, a a a pen pal friend, if nothing else. He's been really, really helpful to me. He's a great resource, and mm. and he's just a lovely guy, and he's also super open minded. And he came out to see me one night with an orchestra, and I knew he was there. And I tried to do something experimental with the orchestra, and it was the only one I've ever done that I would say was absolutely terrible. <laughs> and and after after it was after it was done, he came and visited me in, in the dressing room. I said, "Yeah, God, you know, I kind of messed that up. I was trying to be cool because you were there." And I said, "You know, I, I when I, I told them to." Um, Oh, I can't remember what, I, you know, I wish I could remember what he said to me. But basically what he was saying was if I wanted them to to make a bad sound, I needed to tell them what the bad sound was. Yeah. And I wasn't being specific enough, and I was trying to get these screeches out of people, and they didn't understand mm -hmm. what I was saying because, as you know, when you're working with an orchestra, you need to be really specific. <laughs> and also there is... 70 people or 80 people in the orchestra and you've got they all have different ideas what that that's is right yeah i've done improvisation pieces as well and actually it's quite hard because you you mm. have to specify the pitches from which they yep. can choose yeah how long they go how often they get them played and yeah. sometimes even after whom they're going to play them yeah after which other group maybe you've got to maybe organize them in groups it's actually quite hard and but it's you, you. But people think it's easy, and um, it's a, it's a, yeah. It's it's not as simple. But it's interesting how you have to try it to know that it's not easy. Yeah, you know? and it's it's you can't just know you, absolutely not, because and every orchestra will be different. And also, yes. some orchestras are more used to being an improvising orchestra, yeah. and some are less. Yeah, no, that's right. And they have different attitudes about it too. I mean, I had I had a clarinet. I had, I, had, I had a clarinetist uh, maybe about three weeks ago who was very upset that I asked him to play something, and he went he went to the union, and so I got in oh. trouble that night. Oh, no. And the reason was is because I called him out by name. That's <gasps> what upset them, it, it, because I had learned people's names, and I thought I was being polite. So I was like, I don't know, you know, Ira, can you give me— a gliss between these notes and then three on this. And he's like, and then afterwards I like realized I gotten in trouble. Oh. Uh, so it's best usually to only do that with the brass. <laughs> Cause they're like, yeah, yeah Tom's ready. And then they, yeah. they do it, but not the woodwinds as much. Right. Or actually be in if it woodwinds, possibly less specific is better because they have this special yeah. Parts where they can't do glitz and That's they have right. to do them. It's called quasi quasi glitz. You have to right. like I put them in quotation marks, and they just because I don't know. I don't know between. Which I only notes. know because of the Gershwin. I yes. only know because you hear go, yes. and then you hear the glisses exactly. in a certain range. The rest of it, they're kind of faking a glitz, right? Faking exactly, and and it's nice, and it all. It's actually interesting how every clarinetist will do this differently. Because they have also different make of a clarinet, you know. It's it's, but I don't go to specifics because I again I forget <laughs> no matter yeah, what they tell me to do. But you orchestrate constantly. Yeah, yeah, and it's you know. it, it's it's actually can you believe it? I will 
you know, I don't say it lightly, but it's my least favorite job. Yeah. I mean, I because it's so time consuming and, yeah. and so incredibly laborious. And it's fun at the very end of it, because at the end of it, you start putting little things here and little things there. Mm-hmm. And, and a piece is already there and it's just doing more uh, fine, fine detail work. And that's really fun. But actually putting the first notes in and saying, oh, the bass line and uh, who does it, just, you know, like just basics, you fill out the orchestration. A lot of decision making. Yes. It's a lot of decision making. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a lot of understanding the instruments and how how yeah. the, the tessitura of the instrument how it's going to sound and the reason that I like to improvise with the I don't I don't let the orchestra improvise I dictate but uh, the reason I like that is because I get constant feedback I constantly hear what if I did that and I might say oh because it could even be an octave uh, issue you know I could say oh I need to get the double basses to play this. And then once they start doing it, I'm like, oh, no, I need them to do that an octave higher. That's what I need. Like, But in my head, I thought it would work an octave lower. And that seems like it would be the dumbest thing in the world, like you would know that. But I have to hear that constantly in order to understand it. But it's it's interesting that you say that because I do that, even though I've done millions of pieces, I still make mistakes and I still write bass in the wrong register because I don't know it. It's different material. Right. It will sound differently. In some materials, it will sound great when it's growling on the very, very, very bottom. Yes. But sometimes it makes it uh, draggy if it's too mm-hmm. low. And That's you right. hear it, And you just hear this very uh, kind of very unbright sound, you know, very kind of an interesting dull sound if it's too low. So it depends um, if you if it's a feature or not. Or Mostly, I always say devil bass. Um, is one instrument that um, wins from having orchestra above it. It's like a floor on which orchestra sits. Yeah. But the floor can only shine if, if everything else shines. So it kind of makes, well, it's the opposite, actually. It makes the orchestra shine. Um, it's a very interesting instrument. It's a um, balance, you know. yeah. Yeah, it's it's. it's I think so, too. It's, it's, and I'm glad yeah. you call it a floor because, you know, uh, I, I had to really consider why bass? Because I was traveling with this, a six-piece uh, ensemble, and we had no bass. We didn't have a double bass. The closest we had a double bass was a bass clarinet mm-hmm. and my left hand on the piano. Mm-hmm. And it made me ask myself as a rock musician, why bass? Is it because I want to establish the floor tonally? Because I want to say, okay, this is the first inversion chord. or 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 is it because I want a contrapuntal landscape underneath something, or is it because I want to shake people's asses because they just <laughs> like to feel to, to, yeah. to feel bass. And I realize it's, it's, it's different for everything. Like sometimes it's because you want to qualify the chord, right? Other times it's because you want to balance the tone. I'll tell you something that I found completely mind blowing. Uh, watched a whole movie with the score it was a big Hollywood movie, and it was a big Hollywood uh, 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 composer. Does this all the time. Probably does it on a keyboard mostly, right? The London Symphony Orchestra was the orchestra. It was done in Air Studios. And it sounded pretty good. Yeah, I was like, ah, sounds pretty good. Mm-hmm. Got to the very end. The end credits came up, and all of a sudden, it was playing Mozart. Suddenly, it's Mozart. And it sounded unreal good. Like all of a sudden, the orchestra sounded amazing. So I thought they must have recorded this in a different studio with a different orchestra. Same day, same orchestra. Ah. The difference was is that Mozart in this piece was stacking the band in such a way that sonically was made it sound like it was twice as loud, twice as tall, big, massive, and he was doing nothing. Nothing was happening. Just a couple parts. And I just thought, this is oh. the problem, is that, you know, like like when you, when, when you compose too theoretically and you don't think about how the band is going to sound, that that oh, happens. This, the spacing is incredibly uh, difficult and important. Yeah. It's like, you because you have to think, I mean, most of, mostly use small orchestras. Um, yeah, Less right. instruments, but... When you have a full orchestra, you've got, you know, woodwinds, brass, strings, and then you've got 
discussion harp um and timpani so yeah um so you have spacing within the group or yeah. spacing between groups right and then overall you know and so um you constantly i'm constantly in two minds am i going to make strings the main event or mm -hmm. is it going to be just one solo string could be yeah. uh, is it going to be who who does the you know on the bottom as you know there's a whole lot of overtones you know every yeah. tone is many many tones so it depends it so much depends if on the bottom you've got what we call a fifth or mm -hmm. an octave yeah. and if you have an octave it's, it can be more spacious but if you have a fifth it's more full and rich you know so it just depends what uh, instruments and how everything else is around it and what you double with what um for years i was trying not to double anything but then it becomes too thick and then nothing you can hear really one big mess <laughs> you know so um so you have to actually double if you you know uh, like i do a lot of bassoon uh you know and double bass but you know yeah doubling because because they I love that. what they do yeah they also it sort of stays more kind of it becomes more solid you know mm -hmm. i feel if yeah, the you hear it. Is involved. Yeah, if, and, it puts and, a marker on it. It's like listen to this. It's like yeah. putting flute over your first violins. Yeah, or a piccolo is even better. Yeah, I love that. Oh, it yeah. just adds where the piccolo goes. We're here, and the flute yeah. kind of goes. We're airy, you know, if it's yeah. down in the same. And I, I like that sound. It's, it's happy. Yeah, and also it's, recently I was thinking because I've, I've written this piece and I thought oh, I really wish I had a piano in it. And then I thought, well, what's the closest to the piano in the orchestra? Basically, it is flutes, you know. It is yeah. flutes and clarinets, really. Once you mix them ah, together, they okay. sound more like piano than anything else, really, in harp. the orchestra. Yeah, harp as well. But harp is a bit, sometimes too tiny on the top. Yeah. But, um, I, I mean, it's very squeaky, squee not squeaky, um, very present, you know, very kind of sharp. It's very sharp. Yeah. Um, but to have, like, the mild sound. Um, I, I, mm. Anyway, it depends what material, of course. I yeah. do a lot of, I, yeah, I do combine harp with a lot of uh, vibraphone and like glockenspiel. You know, that's very nice sound if, yeah. you, if, you, if one likes that sort of thing. It's time to bring in questions. We bring in questions from the audience. Hey, Ben, I just wanted to call in and ask a quick question. The piano is an instrument that's been around for a really long time and it's something that's used in, you know, like a lot of different contexts. Do you think the piano is universal because it reflects what the human ears like to hear? Or more so, do you think the piano has shaped of what we are expecting to hear? You know, kind of like a bit of a chicken and an egg question. Love the podcast. Thanks so much. Well, I mean, I think that's a great question. It, it's <clears throat> That's a question that almost applies to anything we like. Do we like it because it was the thing that was there? Or is it there because it was the thing that we needed that we liked? I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know anyone that plays music that doesn't feel piano is the most valuable helicopter's view of a piece of music. You just stand over it and you can see it. And I think the value uh, in that, as soon as as soon as any keyboard came around, must have been must have been huge. Now in every in every um, generation, I think the piano means very different things. In my generation, it was middle class furniture. It was middle class living room furniture. Everybody played the piano. Kids had to take piano lessons, and it didn't seem very cool, like in 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 rock music. Uh, so the context of the piano for me as a rock player was awesome. I got to abuse middle class living room furniture, right? Um, <laughs> But um, I would say that aside from maybe things that we can do on the computer right now or your imagination, I don't think that there's a better instrument from which to see the landscape of the thing that you're ma that you're making and have control over the orchestration, the uh, the, the the harmony. You you get to be the orchestra at that point. And, and for that reason, I have to think, and this is just a theory, once it came along, it must have been mind-blowing. The first, the first keyboards must have been even a harpsichord, which is like, you know, it doesn't have any velocity control over it, must have been pretty amazing. Uh, uh, what, what, do you, what do you know about that? Because, see, I'm, I'm here with a real... Uh, an actual scholar of music <laughs> who plays piano better than I do. So, 
but I only play piano. But yes, harpsichord is actually a great instrument. Good you say that. Um, but it's very soft. So when you yeah. write for harpsichord with the orchestra, you've got to amplify it. Um, it's not in itself. It sounds sometimes just like a percussion. <laughs> you know, if it's it fast, does. sometimes you lose the pitch. It's a bit like I find that, by the way, with bassoon as well. If it's very fast, you kind of lose the pitches. You know, you don't yeah. have the attack. Um, but um, piano is, for me, piano is the queen of all instruments or, or king, uh, whatever it is. We'll go with um, it's it, it's uh, because uh, that's just my, I call it my tool. You know, it's it's my kind of that was my nickname. extension. <laughs> really? Oh, amazing! No, no. It's extension. Ex- <laughs> I, I, well, probably not. Well, anyway, as you say, I, I trust you. You know, I believe everything you say. So this <laughs> you is how I, I punch it. Yeah, but I, I do. I am a literal, very literal person. I, I, I no, you're a trusting, everything. kind person. And someone no, star- no, starts just... talking shit and you're like, oh, really? <laughs> you flew yeah, yeah. into the air yesterday. Every, it's amazing. Every, everybody can uh, make fun of me because I truly, <laughs> at first, it takes a minute or two to be, ah, that can't be true. <laughs> Hey, I, can first, I ask you yeah. something? Um, you're, uh, did you say uh, you're working on a piano concerto again? Another one? Okay. Yes. <laughs> now this is this is because you you know I I, I haven't done a whole lot of uh, uh, writing for orchestras, but since I wrote one, let me ask you how how are you going about that? Like how, what's how are you literally for a simpleton? How how are you, how are you constructing this? Well, first of all, I loved your concerto. Can I just Thank say you. that? Because I, I really, and, and uh, yeah, it's great. There were sounds in it. I thought, oh, what is that? I remember asking you that. It was just so great. Um, how do I go? Well, first of all, I've already written three or four, actually. I, yeah. and, I wrote one for myself to play as a graduation um, at the Conservatorium, and it was my first orchestral work. And I don't count it as a piano concerto that people can play because it yeah. was more like a student work. So I've, since then, I wrote three others. Um, most recently, one uh, two two years ago. Um, yeah, because it so, feels like you just did that. Tamara played that, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. It was uh, in memory of uh, Bach's first wife, who died very young, and uh, Maria Barbara. So this one is for um, a different lineup of instruments, slightly smaller um, orchestra. Good. And it's for for another <laughs> for a friend of mine. Um, who I studied with um, called Lisa Moore, and uh, she lives in New York. She's a pianist, um, and I think she even teaches at Yale. I'm not sure. Uh, she's a performing. She used to be with Bang on a Can All Stars. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, amazing. Yeah, yeah uh, she is amazing. And um, we've, we've been talking about different projects. I mean, she recorded a full album of my piano works in, was it 98, I think, um, and it was the first album of, of mm. my piano music that anyone has recorded. So that's um, how far back we go uh, with um, collaboration on pieces. But um, so I've written her sonata. And so this time we decided I would love to write her. Well, we both wanted concerto. So I actually have written it. I have written it. I'm just now orchestrating it. Okay. So, so uh, how did you... How, how did you um... I hate the phrase "walk me through" because everyone says that, okay. but it's the best okay, way. No. Can you walk me through yeah. the blank page yeah. and how you were thinking about making a piece that you knew the person who was going to play it? You're 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 composing it for her. Well, I well I know that Lisa plays um, a lot of. She's done the whole Philip Glass album. She plays a lot of Steve Reich's music. She plays uh, Frederick Shevsky, but she also plays Janáček. And uh, she, mm. you know, she, she has a re- wide range. She's incredibly um, rhythmical, percussive player, okay. as she can be. I mean, she could also be lyrical. But I thought to start with, um, first of all, it's definitely gonna, was going to be a movement work because having um, three, four movements is a normal thing for piano concerto. Yeah. And it's a good thing. And also gives you a chance to write in different styles or yeah. different moods. How many movements just, this? Four. Okay. It's in four movements. And I decided to do something I didn't do before, and that is to work with different parts of the instrument. And that's why the title of the piece is called Registers. Oh, so it's, cool. It's all about registers and uh, different, but also registers of your mind and what registers with you. So it's a lot of different connotations of the word. 
Um, but it goes really low, it goes really high. There's a lot of very repetitive figures. Um, so, yeah, but how did I go about it? First, yeah. again, I spent weeks and weeks just improvising. Okay. It's it's truly just, um, you know, I don't know if you can see this, but, um, you know, there's millions of, you know, just, just stupid, stupid, like stupid pieces of paper that I just, you know, write Those look like smart on. pieces of paper to me. <laughs> it's like everywhere, they're everywhere. My whole room is full of <laughs> papers. And then I I start giving ticks after a few days. I, I, I analyze, is it good? Is it bad? If anything is good, I give it to sort of um, red pen, <laughs> red pen mark. Okay, that's a little bit of a tick. Maybe, <laughs> it's a maybe. And then um, I kind of collect all this material and, and sort of put them in front of me on this one, you know. Do you use, board. like the way that you sent me the, the recordings on uh, voice notes, do you do that as well or do you just go straight to the page? Um, no, I, I, I don't record on the, because I've never done that for myself. I wrote, right. only recorded those bits for you because... Well, uh, how else would you have heard it? Well, that's the but, best way, yeah, yeah, for me to yeah. hear them. Yeah. For, yeah, and also for me, it's easier than writing because that writing takes time. Um, yeah, but why? That's kind of I guess that's why I'm wondering. What, so why you're sitting there, exactly. you're, you're improvising, and then that's one thing, and then you have to go. Okay, yeah. I'm stopping now. I'm going to get out paper yeah. and and write it. Why? Why do you do that? Well, I do. Um, it's so sh it's such shorthand that I write. You know, I can write just a line and a code symbol, and that's enough for me to know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have to explicitly write everything. And um, and then yeah, but sometimes yeah, on occasion I have improvised something. I and you know why? I oh, sorry, I recorded something on the phone because then I play to it. You know, and I okay. try more things. So that's already next level or next uh, stage after I know a bit more about the piece. So I'm walking you back into the piece. So um, I decided the first movement will be really percussive and um, mm -hmm. kind of um, uh, drivey, but also strange. And also, I finally decided to come back to my 20 years ago, I wrote a, you know, a lot of dissonances and clusters and things. So I kind of go back to that a little oh. bit. Just kind of that the sound is not too too clean, that it's not so I've kind of got bored with the tonality a little bit just now. And oh, no. I thought for no, but they still there. It's Don't still leave there. us. Still there. Don't, Don't leave us. <laughs> A minor, A minor says no. Don't go. Don't no. go. No, it's still there. It's still there. Don't worry. But okay. um, Lisa uh, is very much in the modern music, and and I thought, well, it needs to be something more kind of yeah, um, right, and gutsy, gutsy mm -hmm. and edgy. It's it's not unpleasant. It's not at all like ugly yeah. sound. But it's it's um, so every so often there's like a big bang, you know. Like I wanted it to be noisy and you know fun, very fun. It's very fun. It has a lot of rhythm. That's another thing. <sighs> I'm sort of rhythmic. Once, once you're there and you're uh, kind of like, okay, so that's the first marks on the page. It's a piano concerto. So you are, this is born in the real playing of the piano. It's not born in a theory of, of playing the piano because I've heard those and I don't like those as much. They don't yeah. make the piano sound like the piano can sound. They're not like a player. Yeah. So you're rooting this in the way that, that uh, is Lisa? Yes. Lisa will play. Will. Yeah, the way that the way Lisa will play. Yeah, and 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 this, of course, from the first time I sketched it, maybe two months went by, and I kept changing ideas. Mm -hmm. And at first, I thought the orchestra and Lisa play all the same, and then I thought, no, Lisa will play something different, and the orchestra mm -hmm. will play this material. So you choose who does what. Yeah, and concerto is all about um, about you know, working concurrently sort of and working towards each other or against each other. Yes, so exactly. It's, it's, yeah. So, and sometimes only orchestra plays and sometimes only piano plays, but yeah. very rarely. I mean, most of the time they interact, interact, interact. So there's all that sort of feeling. But first I thought I'll write the piece first and then work out who does what, you know? Uh, how did you approach like the number or how, how did you approach the, the cadenza parts? Like uh, when, when, when you hit those moments, do you feel they need to go off like the, a bridge in a rock song, which is its own thought, like its own improvised thought? Or do you feel like it needs to say something about or repeat something that's 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 in the piece? How, how do you view those? Yeah, you do know it's so interesting. I really hate cadences. 
Really? Just really? Yeah. I mean, because they feel like I, they're showing off. Well, they feel like they're just slipping on. It's like something that has unrelated, often unrelated to the uh-huh. piece, and you just kind of have to. You have to kind of write it. Yeah. But I don't like writing it because it's all about virtuosity or showing off. And mm. I have often done the anti anti cadenza. Often I've written a very slow piece for just to, to for the either piano or when mm-hmm. I did the eight eight double basses piece um, called the Witching Hour. I wrote cadenza for them. They just played harmonics because that's what double basses do amazingly, yeah. as you know. That's and it became like glass harmonica sound. Yeah. And um, and that was the moment that everybody thought was actually the best moment of the piece. Um, so it's a cadenza, but not, it's still very hard, but right. not really uh, fast music. So um, I think it's just, I think when I think about writing a very fast music, I just think, ah, oh, I don't feel like it, you know, because it has not. So it's, there's two things. You either write a piece of music that's going to be great and people are going to like, or you write something as a showcase, uh, as a vehicle for a performer. And Mm -hmm. I think the hardest thing is to put the two together, you know, um, in the concerto. And you have to, because concerto has to be both. It has to appeal to listeners and uh, and the orchestra, but the solace has to be showing the brilliance and their strengths have to be shown. And, um, of course, at the end, you have to think about the balance between orchestra and the pianist. But... um, it's it's a very a very very good question. Hey, last time when we talked, we yes. we did we uh, you did an exercise. You gave us an, a new week's resolution, which was an exercise to do every week. Do you remember what you gave us? Yes, I do. I do. I and I think I'm still. I can't think of anything better. <laughs> I like to get all of my guests to give an exercise mm. to the listeners, something that is a doable exercise that you would recommend. Everyone does for a week, and I do it for the week as well. Not complain. Not complain. So this week, you're, the exercise is don't complain. Is it possible? Let's turn it into an exercise. Let's say... How do we do that? Make a note. Anytime you complain, notice it. If by the end of the week, you can find yourself not complaining after you make the note, then you get a cookie. <laughs> Is that good? That sounds good. And not complaining about the cookie if it's not the one you'll want. That's right. No complaining about the cookie. No. And and no complaining that it takes me like six weeks to ship the cookie. <laughs> but okay. it's one week, right? It's only for one week. It's only for one week. So for one week, you have to take note of when you think you're going to complain. Also, um, do you know, we did an improvisation in the studio in our failed technical failed uh, podcast, which we did <laughs> capture, and yes. you you played like I don't know, like what four, three or four different improvisations, and I used one. Yeah, I'm sure the others were terrible. <laughs> it's like, I, mean, I don't know. And this one probably you made you just made it good. I think I think you made it much better than I'm sure than oh. I did. But uh, well, it was fun know. to work with. It made me think we need to record like that some because it was so easy. You're you you think like a, a a musician in a rock band, like you're you were jamming a part like Asnata kind of riff thing, and suddenly I feel like churning out words and melodies. Yeah, but you're amazing. You are absolutely incredible, and you were playing uh, patterns on the first. You did the percussion instrument, but you also yeah. played guitar, and it helped because when I have this kind of bed of whatever you're doing. Um, I can build things on that and it makes it so much easier because there's this, you, I know you were there and it was so fun. And then you were making those fantastic noises. Yeah. I couldn't get those it in was, the recording. They're, oh, they're not really shame. like I was doing that and stuff. Hey, um, so we're going to play that tape uh, as, <laughs> as, as, uh, as, as part of it. And so that everyone understands what we were doing, I brought, I brought my, uh, my memoir. And we chose a passage from it to make a song from. And that's what you were improvising to. And the passage was one of my teachers, who's a music teacher, sent me home from school for for making noises with my mouth, and I wouldn't stop. And after she sent me out of class and gave me a lecture, I came back in and I started doing it again. So she wrote this thing. My mother had it uh, in, uh, in her drawer back home and it just said Ben is making strange sounds with his mouth 
Uh, this has been going on for a long time. Uh, yesterday, after a long lecture, Ben has started again today or something like that. So that's what that's what you'll be hearing, kids. It's such a funny line. It's such a funny line. I can just imagine you as a kid, as this very, very talented kid doing this kind of thing. Because lucky thing is that I have the book and I love that book. I thank love you. that book. Thank you so much for giving it to me. Oh, and you. it's so fun to read about what you've, how you were growing up and what you've went through. And Oh, my God, adventures. It's a real adventure book. People's lives are full of adventures. If we find a way to frame them, then, then you got something. I had way too many adventures that I didn't even jump into because I didn't know how to how to frame it and mm. tell the story. Mm. That's so All cool. Right. So nice to see you. And Good thank you, everyone. You. And I, you know, look forward to this, you know, being somewhere. It'll be somewhere. <laughs> They'll make it into something good. They got our backs. Elena and I met in the studio and she improvised a piano piece to a passage from my book, A Dream About Lightning Bugs. And the passage is one of many disciplinary slips from my school years in which I was sent home constantly for misbehaving. I built a pop song around her motif and here it is. Ben is making strange, strange sounds with his mouth. This has been going on for some time. Ben is making strange, very strange, strange sounds with his mouth. This has been going on for some time. Yesterday, after a long lecture, Ben has continued again today. Very Hi, if you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. Thank you, oh so much, for watching Lightning Bugs on YouTube. Check out more episodes and subscribe if you have not already. You can also listen to Lightning Bugs wherever podcasts may be found.